Hi everyone, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today we're going to be talking about three books that I've read recently that really taught me a lot about the Spanish Civil War and Franco's regime. I was feeling a little bit embarrassed that I didn't know all that much about this particular event in history, this time period really in the history of Spain. And so I wanted to dig into it a little bit more and I found three really great books that I want to share with you today. If you're a teacher or maybe you're taking some kind of like a European history class, I think these books could be really helpful to you. So I will link all of those down below. And it is the end of April now and so I always like to just kind of show you the other books that I read during a month even if they don't fit within the theme that I've chosen for this month, but just to give you a couple of other recommendations. On audiobook this month, I read This Will All Be Over Soon by Cecily Strong. She is on Saturday Night Live, she's a comedian, and I was expecting, kind of anyway, <laughs> this book to be funny, despite the title and the cover. I guess it really doesn't promise to be funny in any way, besides the fact that she's a comedian. Um, so this book is more about grief than anything else. This is uh, kind of a tribute to a cousin of Cecily's who passed away right before the pandemic began. So it's kind of her journal through quarantine and grieving the loss of a family member. But because she is Cecily Strong, it is funny in places and interesting and moving. And so I do recommend this one. There's a song at the end that uh, her late cousin wrote and recorded with his band and it's a beautiful song and I thought that was just such a cool way to end the book. Another book that I read this month is one of my favorites of the year so far. This one's called Unlikely Animals by Annie Hartnett. We will have to talk about this one more because it reminds me quite a bit of We Ride Upon Sticks which is one of my favorite books ever. This one is just kind of similar in the sense that it's collectively narrated and there's like a little bit of magical realism in it. It's really funny. The characters are unique and kind of wacky. There's actually quite a bit of history in it as well and it does a really good job of telling the story of people who have been impacted by the heroin epidemic. So we'll have to talk about this one more later. But in the meantime, I highly recommend this one. I have a theme in mind for this one already. So this one is Red Lip Theology by Candice Marie Benbow. And I follow her on Instagram and Twitter and she was the one who made me aware of the book called Bad and Bougie, which you might have heard me talking about on Instagram quite a bit. It's a really strange book because it was written by this white girl who I know because I went to college with her. I don't know her well, but we did a year of college in the same place, you know, um, who's now like a professor at that same Christian university. And she wrote a book about trap feminist theology and it's a train wreck. <laughs> but it reminded me that we should be reading theology and feminist theory from the perspective of black women and this book did not disappoint. This one is really, really good. So we'll get into this one with a couple of others that I have in mind pretty soon. Okay, so jumping into the books about the Spanish Civil War, just gonna tell you the three we're gonna talk about. Um, this one is A Long Petal of the Sea by Isabel Allende. I initially just picked this up because of the cover. I thought the cover was so beautiful. I had no idea what it was about. And actually this one was part of my rainbow. I was trying to make a little like rainbow stack in my last apartment actually. And so I just went to the bookstore looking for a book with a, a blue spine. <laughs> the Fountains of Silence by Ruta Sepetis. This one's pretty long. People have been recommending her historical fiction to me for quite a while. A lot of people use her books, you know, in like middle school or high school classrooms. And sometimes I'm just like not in the mood for like middle grades novels, but oh my goodness, this one is so good. And it's definitely more of a crossover. Like this is amazing for adults and for students. So we'll get into this one as well. And then lastly, um, I talked about this one last month a little bit, but this one is All That Followed by Gabriel Urza. And this one is written specifically from the perspective of a Basque community in like the Pyrenees Mountains. So there's a little bit more about this one in my, my last video, but we're gonna get to this one as well. So I would recommend beginning with 
a long petal of the sea because this one gives you the most information about the actual war. This book really provides a lot of context. I'm just going to read you a quick section here. Um, it reminded me of the, the latest season of Peaky Blinders. So between World War I and World War II, we do see this rise in fascism in many of these European countries. Um, and so this is giving us some background information. The conservatives in the Catholic Church who had invested money, propaganda, and apocalyptic sermons from the pulpit in the opposition cause were defeated in the 1936 elections by the Popular Front, a coalition of left-wing parties. Spain was split into two as if struck by an axe, claiming they wanted to restore order to a situation they said was chaotic, even though this was far from the truth, the right wing immediately began plotting with the armed forces to overthrow the legitimate government made up of liberals, socialists, communists, and trade unionists backed by the enthusiastic support of workers, peasants, and the majority of students and intellectuals. So that's on like page 15, and that got me very, very interested to see how this proceeded because we are seeing, you know, a few of those parallels in the United States as well. A more liberal candidate winning an election and then a conservative movement backed by churches attempting to delegitimize the election and overthrow the government. So I was like, how have we not been looking at this situation more closely and just keeping the story of Spain in the back of our minds as we, you know, just kind of proceed through life in 2022 in the United States. But I don't, I didn't know a whole lot about this and I'm guessing a lot of people don't as well. Another section I was looking at, um, there, there's a purge because the fascists win. Uh, Francisco Franco was in charge of the conservative side. Um, first, the fascists would arrest any combatants they could lay their hands on, wounded or not along with those denounced by others as collaborators or suspected of any activity considered anti-Spanish or anti-Catholic. This included members of trade unions, left-wing parties, followers of other religions, agnostics, Freemasons, teachers at all levels, scientists, philosophers, students of Esperanto, foreigners, Jews, gypsies, and so on in an endless list. Again, you know, just thought that was worth paying attention to. I ended as a really good job though of kind of showing the horrors of war. So the main characters in this book are these two brothers who were on the left side. You know, the, they were Republicans, not nationalists. Their father's, you know, an atheist. They're not part of the church. So they're of course fighting against Franco. One of the brothers is just a, a soldier. Like that is his identity. The other one is a doctor or like training to become a doctor. And so he is treating people on the battlefield. Um, and it does talk about the atrocities that the Republicans committed as well. They murdered priests and nuns who were part of the right. And so this was an awful, awful war. And Andy does an amazing job of describing this for us and kind of showing us what it was like. And again, I learned so much just from the beginning of this book. So each chapter actually begins with a quote from Pablo Neruda. I didn't know this either, but he was from Chile and he arranged for these men and women in Spain. They had escaped Spain and they were in these like concentration camps in France because they would have just literally been like shot point blank by Franco and his regime. So um, Neruda arranges for them to get on the ship and come to Chile. And so that's what happens to um, two of the characters in this book. And so then, you know, a long petal of the sea actually refers to Chile because it has that long coastline. It's a skinny country in South America. So that was just a really interesting sort of twist on the history of the Spanish Civil War. I didn't know about this, that there were Spanish refugees who went to Chile. And then we kind of follow their story and they eventually become refugees again because they have to flee the regime of Pinochet. So I think they go to Venezuela. And so just to see like these similar shifts in government, that's a very euphemistic way to say it, but that someone could live through in a single lifetime on completely different continents and just to see how a lot of these same ideas and same um, tactics and strategies are like recycled quite often. So this one, oh my gosh, it's it's definitely a page turner because you just, 
you just need to know what's happening next. Um, so this is like further in the future, I forget the year, but this is another thing that just was kind of like, why are we not paying closer attention to the history of Spain and Chile right now? I think at this point there was a pretty liberal government that had, you know, been elected and been in power. Um, and then like just recently, yes, the conservative government had taken over um, and said other professional associations, factory owners, and business organizations also imposed a shutdown. When truck drivers refused to work, the long thin country was left without transport. Fish rotted in the north, vegetables and fruit in the south, while in Santiago there were shortages of essentials. Allende, not the author, just an actual historical figure in the book, uh, roundly denounced North American intervention in their financing of the truck drivers and right-wing conspiracies. So one thing about history in general is that it's, it's just always relevant. Like, you can read about history of Spain, the history of Chile, and there, there are overlaps with things that we're seeing today or just other things we've seen in the past or something we might see in the future. And so I just think that this book is incredibly important, so beautifully written, so incredibly well written. It's absolutely fantastic and just a perfect example of historical fiction being an amazing way to teach readers about history and politics and things that have happened in the not so distant past. I think Isabella Allende is one of my new favorite authors, so I also just bought this book. It's called the House of Spirits. Again, I didn't even check to see what it's about. I just love her writing, so I bought it. So this one might be coming up soon. Okay, so then Fountains of Silence actually takes place in like the 1950s. Yeah, 1957 in Madrid. And so this is during Franco's actual regime. So he wins. I think one thing that's kind of unique about Spain is that because of the Civil War, they didn't enter World War II with these other fascist dictators like Mussolini, Hitler. Um, so they are not taken down, you know, by the Allies. So even as Mussolini is gone, Hitler is gone, there's still this fascist dictator in Spain for a long time, until the 70s. So this book takes place in the 50s, and the main character is this kid or like I think he's a senior in high school um, and his dad is an oil tycoon in Texas his mom's actually from Spain and they go on this like summer trip to Madrid because his dad is making oil deals with Franco and they're staying at this like beautiful Hilton in Madrid and so this book a, a big part of it is about how willing Americans were to work with this fascist dictator in the 50s and Ruta Sepetis has done teachers an enormous service by providing so many primary source documents like every five or six chapters every time there's kind of like a shift in the story there's new primary source documents to kind of back up what's happening in the story so as a teacher you could definitely just like take those primary source documents and do a lot with them this book would be a great one to assign to like high schoolers, if they're taking like a comparative government class or world history class, European history class, something like that. It is pretty long, but it goes by really quickly. It's really fascinating. Um, there's subplots about bullfighting and just the continued consequences for people who were Republicans. So they were against the nationalists, against Franco and their descendants. So if you were the child of Republicans, you're still ostracized. And the church is very complicit in all of this as well. There's some horrible, horrible things that happen to pregnant women in this book that is, it's just, you know, your worst nightmare. But this one is great because I don't think too many people, you know, know a lot about what life was like under Franco. And again, it was just very, very conservative. Um, women were very oppressed and had a, a very strict life that they had to lead. And let me give you another resource. There was an amazing episode the other day of On the Media about how it impacts democracy when women are oppressed. Like what can we learn from looking back at, and, and they look specifically at Franco's regime and Italy under Mussolini, and what happens to democracy when women's rights are restricted. 
and it, it's just really really interesting to look at so here's kind of another side of that history of Spain and then this one all that followed um, is set in the Basque country and it's more like in the 90s so this is actually after Franco has died things are changing the government is changing but it does a lot of flashbacks to the war and Franco's regime and what that was like for Basque people in particular. They're a ethnic and language minority within Spain. So people of um, Catalonia, which you'll see in um, the Fountains of Silence, and then people in the Basque country were targeted by Franco because he wanted everybody to speak Spanish, everybody to have the same exact Spanish culture, everyone to be Catholic, and then you have these Basque and Catalan people who don't fit with what he wants every Spanish person to be. So I think it's most interesting to read, you know, about a particular historical event from the perspective of those people on the margins to see what was actually going on. Oh, and one more thing about um, the Fountains of Silence. It also talks about this uh, monument, like to all the people who died during the Spanish Civil War, and it's like really creepy, just kind of awful. I forget the name of it. It doesn't say on the back but that's another thing that's like worth looking up and an issue that comes up like with all of these books like after Franco dies is it worth it to go after everybody in his regime and like keep dividing the country um, or should they just move on and in Spain they just like move on and don't really talk about all of the horrible atrocities that happened no one is really held accountable although under Franco's regime anybody who opposed him was just like shot point blank. So a lot of those types of issues are brought up within like all three of these books. There's a lot of crossover. So this one is the most like on the edge, like it's it's less about the Spanish Civil War and a little bit less about Franco's regime, but it's the aftermath of that and particularly in the Basque country and how that all leads to the ETA, which is a Basque separatist group who, you know, come about as a direct response to Franco wanting to protect their language and their culture and their, um, you know, Euskara speaking schools where they would teach the Basque language to their kids and keep their culture alive and Franco wanted to eradicate that. So all three of these, really, really interesting. And then the one person who is referenced in all of these books, besides Franco, I guess, um, is Lorca, who was a poet during the Spanish Civil War and wasn't Catholic, he was gay, and so he was just targeted like on all sides by the nationalists and Franco. And so his poems are a direct response to this fascist uprising, and he's eventually murdered by Franco. Um, and so this book has English on one side and then Spanish on the other side. And poetry is always a little bit difficult for me to get into, but once I know like the historical context and how revolutionary a lot of these poets were, then their work becomes so much more interesting to me. So I never would have bought this like thick book of Spanish poetry <laughs> before this, but now I really want to see what Lorca was writing. And then of course we have Pablo Neruda, who was also a poet and also a revolutionary and also a communist, right? And so again, I'm pretty sure that I have read like Neruda's poems, maybe even like taught them, you know, to students and like shown them here are the different stanzas or whatever. But like, who cares about that? <laughs> what these men were doing with their poetry was literally revolutionary. So reading all of this has you know, even got me more interested in poetry on top of being interested in the history and the politics. So one thing that I like about reading several different books on the same topic is how it does this. It, it provides um, kind of through lines where I see like, okay, this is consistent in all of these stories, like from everybody's perspective, this is important, but then it also gives you like a multifaceted view of an event or a time in history or whatever. So I recommend doing that if you can, if you have time, kind of like choosing little like text sets for yourself. And I think like a movie counts in this, a podcast counts, a documentary. In addition to like a book or two, maybe it's a historical fiction, maybe it's just like a historical monograph, maybe it's poetry, um, but just to learn about 
something through all of these different mediums is so interesting to me just as a person but then this is what makes things interesting for our students as well when we're trying to teach them about a certain topic that maybe like they're having a hard time like finding entry into so merge and combine these things the poetry the history the politics the writing the art there's art that comes out of this time as well the architecture you know geographical places you know this this graveyard like <laughs> there's so many different points of entry into something like the Spanish Civil War, which then also illuminates other historical ev events, you know, like how does this compare and contrast with other fascists or with World War II? Why is it important that they didn't join World War II and how did that change things? And um, American businesses that were willing to work with Franco and like help rebuild the country, how did that impact poor people? Was that beneficial for Spain as a whole? How also was the United States involved, you know, like the CIA in Chile? Like you just end up with all of these offshoots where you can just jump into anything, like anything that um, is interesting to like different students. Like they, they could maybe choose, you know, one of these like 12 different topics that come out of a single one of these books and then continue their own thread of research. So obviously this stuff is really fun to me. I hope that it's fun and interesting to you as well. If you have any other resources about like the Franco regime or the uh, Spanish Civil War, maybe even Chile, like this time period, actually now I want to read more about Chilean history. So I'm not sure if that House of the Spirits is set in Chile or not, but we'll see. So yeah, like this is one of the things about reading. Like <laughs> once you read a little bit, sometimes it just like exponentially multiplies, <laughs> right? Because now you're interested in this and this and this, and you want to read more by this author, and then you want to read more on this topic, and you want to read poetry about it or whatever. So, you know, this this is how I read a lot. Like by reading a little bit, that's kind of how you end up reading a lot because it just unlocks all of these different questions in your mind. Okay, let me go check on this baby, <laughs> see how we're doing. Thank you so much if you've made it this far in the video. I appreciate you. Let me know in the comments down below what other topic like this you would like to see, because clearly this is really fun for me. So um, we, can, we can do more of that. So <laughs> I will see you in my next video. Have a great day. Bye.